What a strong and rainy day. A real northern romantic touch to our tour. We feel warm and safe inside the van on a cozy Swedish day. We visited the University of Malmö and the famous design researcher Pelle N and his colleagues. Reaching the Orison Bridge, which connects Sweden and Denmark, is just overwhelming. Eric's still stuck on our minds. Meeting him was heartwarming for all of us. He's a real passionate student, developing better healthcare technologies in Gothenburg. His project isn't just about redesigning wheelchairs for people in third world countries, it's more about bringing knowledge and support to them in a humble way by listening to their real needs. That's why we want to meet Pele. A real design philosopher and researcher on social innovations and social design. What does social design really mean for us? our students and our societies. Hello Tosca. In the early 70s we had to do with how could futures be made local in the workplace in different ways than something that is completely determined by technology and capital. How could people have a say on which technology is introduced in the workplace? In the 80s, we were looking into a new challenge, saying that what if people should not only have a say on the technology being introduced to the workplace, but actually on the very design of technology. That is not de-skilling, but rather enhance the skills that people have. And then we started to come up to the 90s, where, I mean, everything is now Silicon Valley, and up to the turn of the century and onwards. People are not so worried about information technology at the workplace. We're worried about information technology and influence in other parts of our lives. It's moved into other areas, moved into the public sphere very much, into people's everyday life, not only their working life. So that's why we have been engaging in people's everyday lives in the neighborhoods where they live, especially if there are controversial and conflictual situations, or we moved into like with the maker spaces, other ways of producing than the factory. I mean, there are different strategies. For instance, we collect stories of good example, and then we hope that these will spread, that people will take up. But I guess we've also seen that that's a very limited strategy. They remain good stories, but often the impact or the diffusion is not as big as one would have hoped for. It has to happen at, at many levels. Not least uh, on what we teach and what the design schools are about. How is it possible to prepare those students that we have at the design schools to come out and have another view on why they are there in the professional world? Really interesting things are happening, like engaging students in real controversies in the city and have them work from there rather than from predefined projects which often have an app or another technological device as the outcome. That's one thing, but I mean it's, it's also difficult because who doesn't want to be a successful entrepreneur? Many come with these hopes and aspirations and the, the gurus, the one that they look up to, are typically those who have had those success stories. So I guess this is not for everyone, this is for those who also think that a meaningful professional life could be something quite different. Modern design, as we know, it starts with the Bauhaus. You can say many critical things about the Bauhaus, but it had some basic principles. One principle had to do with how to join art and technology. And then other basic principle had to do with how to join what we're doing in our technology with something that is socially useful and over revolutionary in their time. And I think we have to reinvent that core again and again, learning from, uh, from history. And one of the things is we could learn from Bauhaus, it was too elitistic. Uh, it 
was all the professors uh, and, and artists who had the ideas about how the world should change instead of being more participatory and, and, and listening. So uh, with that said, I think there are a number of attempts today to, to change schools, to, to open up for something that is not so predefined. I mean, I'm a person from 68. We had all the solutions. Today I'm, I'm not at all that sure about all the solutions. Hasn't made me less of a socialist, but, but less of someone that needs to tell others what the solution is, because frankly, I do not know. When we teach social design as a way of co-design, of collaborating with lots of different actors and finding ways of doing that, that actually gives you some other, not only feedback, but self-esteem and value. But then I think the real challenge where I do not know how we prepare the students, if we look at, for instance, at the Occupy movement, how does school prepare young designers for participating in events that happens like this. It's one thing when we can prepare for years, but it seems like many of the situations where design skills are actually very useful are not planned. I don't know if you've heard about Occupy Sandy, when, they, when Sandy hit it, uh, New York and it was quite terrible. And then again, young graphic designers engaged in making signposts that looked like official signposts, but telling people where to go to find supply, etc., and other hacked Google's uh, wedding list and made it into a, a, a system for where to go and put different supply and what was needed in different. So very quickly, again, using their design of the skills in the situation that, that emerges. But how to act in these unforeseen situations? For designers, we've been obsessed with the object of how to design the perfect object. At the same time, we've gradually learned that objects, well, maybe it's also services, there's also a context. They are not so, so clean. And what Latour did, referencing back to, to work by Heidegger, is to take up the early concept of object, namely the concept of the thing, or the thing. Originally, the thing was not an object, but an assembly, an assembly of people trying to deal with matters of concern, it's like in the Icelandic thing, uh, or some people gather to deal with burning issues. That was the core understanding of, of object or thing, and then over the years it has become a material object. And this twist from object to thing, an understanding that we are designing things rather than objects has meant a lot to us. To summarize, again, going back to where I am in the idea of that design also have to follow the early ideas from the Baos and being something that also is part of, of taking the democratic challenge of society. The design thing today can be described as two kind of flickering movements. So the one is between the object or the thing as object, and at the same time, the object as thing in the meaning of an assembly of people who meet to deal with an issue. So it's this flickering, now it's an object, now it's an assembly, now it's an object, now it's an, that's one key understanding. And I mean, it doesn't really fit with how we normally think, but it makes a lot of sense in how to think and how to approach ideas. The other, aspect that goes together with this, with this in the design thing is that it's the idea of making. You know, we talk about making decisions. What's the making in making decision? Uh, and so, and one way to think about the making in making decision, that's what we do in the parliament or in the assembly, where we gather to deal with just controversies and we have some kind of apparatus for this. And, then, and that's, that's central to democracy that we have some kind of parliaments, maybe many, 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 many parliaments. But at the same time, this making for us who come from design is very much a laboratory. It's a laboratory where you do experiments, where you try to do things uh, with materials, try to change materials, move them into something different. 
And the interesting thing is that the parliament and the laboratory, they share a lot of uh, key feature. They boast about how you represent. They boast very much about uh, uh, what is present, what is part of what's being done. So again, we have both now this flickering between laboratory and parliament, and also the flickering between object and assembly. So, so this is how, this is what I think about the design thing. It's very much inspired by that book, but then developed into different kind of practices over the years, and not least in our, in our last book on, on, on making futures, where I think that is key to all the cases, uh, this idea of the flickering between the object and the assembly and the laboratory and the parliament in terms of, of the making. Let me go back to, uh, to Wittgenstein, which is where I very often end up in these discussions. Uh, he had a concept of what it meant to follow a rule in practice. And we all think we know uh, what it means to follow a rule. So it's, uh, if I say one, three, five, I'm pretty sure you would say seven. That's the normal rule following we have. But let's say, uh, I say one, three, five, and you say, shut up. That could actually be the right answer because to follow a rule in practice is not to follow a rule one, three, five, seven, but it's to take the correct next move. And we only really know if that move is the right one or not until we see if it's approved by the others. It is something that very often comes up in the very making. It's not pre-planned. What designers typically do is that they make a move and then they listen to the situations talk back. So how is this, this how are the materials? And, and the materials both being stuff and people and how is it talking back to you and this is this is in the making as you do it and i mean to some extent i guess it's part of human capacity but it's also something that you can train to train our younger colleagues students to be better at listening to the situations talk back and by that making a more interesting next move to be able to follow the rule in a in a wholly owned foreseen way. So this this capacity and if it's where it is, if it sits in the hands, if it sits in the interaction uh, or, or somewhere else, it's less important. Now I think I, I know that you can say that people say a lot of things about this, but but philosophically it's not so much, it's it's more a question of of these interactions and the capacity or the capability to be able to to respond to the situations talk about. What you basically do is that you build up a repertoire of examples. And these examples can be social cases, they can be different materials you've been working with, they can be different artifacts you've seen, they can be certain situations that you know, but you, or it can be different houses or different textures. But you have a big repertoire of this and, and, and the competence is in the specific situation to activate this repertoire and say, oh, this looks a bit like that building by that and that, and or but it's also a bit like that, and I could go on top of that and do so and so. It seems at least to be very much in the hand and in the interaction with the material that it comes up. But the point is that you don't get it for free. You get it for five, 10, 15, 20 years of repeating and repeating and repeating and trying to build this repertoire. If we could support the students with an environment where they could build up a repertoire around such situation and how to act in them, uh, that, that, that would be wonderful. When we started the School of Art and Communication in 1998, we wrote a manifesto for a digital Bauhaus, which acknowledged all this heritage, but tried to see how can young people today interested in new technology, new media, etc. 
how can they transform this into something that is socially useful and interesting without repeating the elitist uh, um, legacy uh, that we have. So uh, for the last 10 years, uh, I've had the privilege of learning a lot from younger colleagues that is taking it on now in different directions. And as we were talking about earlier, uh, what's happening at the schools, I don't know and I'm not sure we're good enough at inspiring those are the, the students now, but I'm hoping that we still can create environments that are inspiring enough to build up a repertoire of, uh, of examples beyond design as we knew it and beyond uh, business as usual. Mm -hmm.